COVID hit the carriage industry very hard here in Charleston, but now they're bouncing back, but they also need help. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with the president and general manager of Pell Metal Carriage Works, Tommy Doyle Jr., for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Tommy Doyle Jr., welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Quentin, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Obviously, you're the president and general manager here at Palmetto Carriage Works. Mm -hmm. Who's Tommy Doyle these days in the midst of COVID? Man, Tommy Doyle is everything. Uh, Tommy Doyle just got back from picking up a load of hay in North Carolina. Uh, day before yesterday, Tommy Doyle was working the cash register. Uh, day before that, Tommy Doyle was answering the phones. Mm -hmm. Earlier in the week, he was cleaning stalls. So it's uh, definitely uh, a new norm, but a good norm. You know, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, people are out, and there's a need for me to, to do that. You talk about there's a need to do that. Obviously, there's a need for help around here. You just mentioned cleaning the stalls up, picking up hay, yeah. answering the phones, using the cash register. Where are we with that? Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's arguably probably the biggest thing facing me right. You know, my problem today is is labor issues. And I'm really trying to figure out how I'm going to proceed forward with that. You know, uh, in an effort to keep all of my employees that I had, I gave everybody a 15% pay increase at the beginning of the season. And that was really hedging my bets that business was going to and is going to continue to come back. Sure. That was a big bet on my part. And fortunately, you know, the first uh, couple of weeks of spring, it's proved to be okay. But, you know, I made, a, I made an effort starting about, you know, a month or six weeks ago to try to start hiring people. And, you know, just to get an idea, a labor job uh, like a barn hand with us, uh, pre-COVID, 10 or $12 an hour was what a barn hand would make. I advertised $15 an hour. I had two people that applied, and neither one of them showed up for the interview, and that's it. Wow. Yeah. Let me ask you, where is the demand? You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where... Uh, I. You know, I saw the unemployment report from last week, hundreds of thousands of people applying for unemployment benefits. And man, I, I don't know if Uncle Sam is making it that much easier to not work, if people don't want to do this job. I'm not really sure what the problem is. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking this is going to be a problem that will be solved with money. You know, I can't. You know, my staff right now is working five, six, and some of them seven days a week to keep up with the, the demand, and that has a shelf life. And um, so at some point, I'm going to have to do something. What exactly is that shelf life normally? You know, so we all, the week before Easter uh, and the week after Easter, those are historically the two busiest weeks of the year. There's more people that want to ride carriages than there are carriages, and that's for that two weeks. As a matter of fact, from my understanding, you're getting a lot more demand in private carriages. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's sort of the, the demographic that we've got coming to Charleston, not people that are concerned with COVID. Um, you know, some people are super concerned, some people aren't concerned, some are going to get the vaccination, some aren't going to get the vaccination. But what we're seeing is people that are coming out, and the ones that are more concerned than others, uh, they're going to take a private carriage, they'll have their own private road, they can request plexiglass to put in front of them. You know, we'll do whatever we need to do to make the uh, customer feel comfortable. Now, you talk about the customer making, making them feel comfortable. What else can they expect here? You know, so we, uh, we sanitize the carriages after every tour. Uh, all the carriage drivers wear a mask. Uh, all the customers sign something that say they're going to wear a mask. We tell them they have to wear a mask, and there's a city official when the carriage departs telling them they have to wear a mask. Right. And the city's been writing tickets to customers that don't wear a mask. Now, is there 100% compliance? Probably not, but I feel as a, as, a, as a business guy, there's not much more that I can do. Now, you talk about obviously the city writing those tickets for those customers. How many of those customers from Palmetto were actually given tickets? Uh, to my knowledge, there's been about four okay. that, were, that were given tickets. And how many of your employees have actually received tickets from the city? Two. Okay. Yeah. Now, obviously you talk about Easter and the week after Easter being extremely busy. Let me ask you this, where are the customers exactly coming from? You know, it's, it's really interesting. They're coming from all over the place. Uh, I'm seeing places that are still locked down tight. Uh, you know, I talked to a couple from New York over the weekend. I was just glad to be able to get into restaurants. 
Uh, same group from California. People have gone out for the weekend just to go somewhere where they can get out and about. You know, there wasn't. There's there, there there hasn't been a whole lot of pushback uh, from most people on the masks, especially people coming from places like New York or California or Chicago where they they've been under that lockdown. Wow. And, and let me ask you this: Obviously, you mentioned people wanted to get vaccinated. Uh, this might be a silly question, but will you actually require customers? as far as vaccines, does it have some sort of proof of that? No, I'm not going to go down that road. You know, uh, personally, I got vaccinated. My wife got vaccinated. I believe in it, but you may not. And my customers may not. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm not going to infringe on somebody's, uh, you know, how they choose to, to live outside of the carriage company. And speaking of the carriage company, I know you told Channel 4, I believe last year you said this quote, it was roughly 10 weeks where we were out of the game. The hardest thing for me is where we ended up laying off 84 people right between March 17th and 20th or so, people who work, who work here have been so committed to me and I feel the same commitment back to them. I can tell you the lowest feeling for me was when I had to load the last two animals to go in the trailer to empty the barn. From the time you issued that particular statement to now, how many animals are back here at the barn? You know, so every animal is back. Uh, even uh, four new ones that weren't here prior to COVID. Okay. Um, they're back working with us. And I'm happy to say that every employee that wanted to come back to work sure. is back to work. Sure. Uh, so we're very, very thankful, you know, that things have played out. You know, if you had asked me a year ago, you and I would be sitting here and I would be complaining or, or I guess talking about labor issues. Just the fact that I'm open and doing it, you know, I'm super excited about that. What are the other labor issues that you are facing right now? You know, so uh, the, we've got our barn handlers, the labor issue, and find a tour guides right now. You know, we get a <laughs> carriage tour guide in Charleston uh, is a tough job uh, from the regulations to the physical demands of the job um, to, you know, you're, you're an actor on stage and to perform in front of your, your group all day long. And combined with that, you know, uh, we got delivered nine new pages of regulation that are supposed to be coming down the pipe. And so you're taking a job that's pretty difficult already, and we're putting in more hoops for us to jump through. And, you know, we'll navigate it. You know, we have. We've been doing this a long time. Uh, you know, my dad did it before I did. And uh, you know, uh, it's just another hurdle that, that will navigate it. You know, I've got a commitment to the business. I've got a commitment to my animals and commitment to anybody that works with me. Now, obviously, you talk about those regulations. Which one concerns you the most? Um, you know, there's, I tell you, it's, it's such in the planning stages right now that there's, there's some going back and forth. Uh, there's really not one uh, that, that I could say worries me more. It's just, you know, there's so many regulations now more regulations on top of that. It just makes it a little more difficult to do business. And, you know, you, you talk about going back to the labor issues. Sure. You know, you're taking, taking a job that's pretty difficult already, and you're going to make more hoops for those guys to jump through. And how many more hoops do you all have to jump through? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's need to get into to this end of it. It's just, just the, the, the labor end. The labor end. Yeah. And I know, from my understanding, I know, I don't know if this is true, but I believe that you met with a hell of those folks about the economic, you know, situation here in Charles. Mm -hmm. What exactly did you take away from that? You know, it, I wouldn't really call it a meeting with Helen as much as she was up here uh, for something else and we were just talking. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, she, she mentioned the same thing. She's hearing that from other aspects of the industry, and you know, not just carriage drivers. They should know the hotel workers, people that clean the hotel rooms, the concierge services, the front desk people. You've got GMs that are cleaning rooms. You know, so there, there's, there's a, a, a very big labor crunch. You know, like I said, I told you that, that arguably it's my biggest problem. I could say there's probably a good argument that that's going to be the biggest problem facing the industry. Uh, if not long term, especially in the next few months. Mm. What do you forecast in the next few months? Um, you know, I'm forecasting things to be pretty good. You know, we saw a good, our normal cycle in spring uh, was families. That's what we see kids on spring break before Easter, kids on spring break after Easter, and you get the, that group that comes, they've showed up. And they, they've been here this week, and hopefully, through, excuse me, last week, and hopefully through this week. And, you know, I hope that we're going to see that that same trend that we've seen for the last 40-some years that we've been in business 
uh, with you know your your late your spring traveler that are going to start starts coming, and then we'll get a little bit of a slowdown at the end of May and a little bit at the end of June, and then the families start coming back at the end of June and get back into that old cycle again. But now, obviously, a lot of people, and I just got mine just last week Friday. But you know, most people get their stimulus checks. Do you believe that this particular time around? Business is going to continue to just be busy. And you know, I, I hope so. I, I, you know, this is just such a weird economy to try to figure out. You know, there seems to be so much cash flushing around out there. Um, you know, the, the the people that are coming here seem to be the same demographic that's been coming to Charleston for years. And you know, the fact that they do have that stimulus check does that help? I, I would think so, absolutely. And what were the demographics doing COVID? Zero. <laughs> there really wasn't much going on, you know. Uh, that that eleven weeks that we were closed down, obviously there was nobody here. But what you got uh, when we opened were people that either didn't care and were going to live their life the way they wanted, or people that were tired of being cooped up and were going to be as careful as they possibly could but live their life. Live their life. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, uh, you mentioned that you uh, welcome back also your boys here mm -hmm. at the, at the, at the uh, barn here. How many of those employees are you talking? So I, you know, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but Quentin, I would bet that it's probably in the low seventies of the eighty-four, you know, that we laid off. And you know, there were some people that they didn't come back after COVID, not for for, for, for reasons other than just not coming back. You know, they got another job, they moved away. It wasn't that they didn't want to come drive carriages in the post-COVID era, come of carriage life just took them. In but like I said, everybody that wanted to come back to work is back at work. And during that eleven month period that you were actually shut down, as we all witnessed, how much money did you actually lost? Oh, lose it. You know, I you know I couldn't even. I mean, you're probably talking hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in, in lost revenue. You know, last year it was the worst year that the carriage company has seen since it's opened and. 1972. But you know, listen, it's no different than other businesses. And let me tell you what, I'm super thankful because I'm here because, you know, my neighbor, the carriage company next to me, didn't make it back yet. Yeah. What will be the future of that particular location? You know, I don't know. It's uh, There's there's some talk uh, about, you know, who owns the building, who owns the lease. Mm. Um, there's really not... It, I haven't. I've spoken with the owner a couple of times over the year, or excuse me, over the last year. But uh, you know, nothing concrete. He's talked about getting back into the business, which he very well may. And as we sit here right now, what is the biggest difference between 1972 and right now when you think of the Palmetto Carriage Works? I uh, you know, it's it's a big business now. Um, you know, a lot of people depend on it. You know, I talked about my dad working here. All of my siblings work here. Uh, there's. There's just a lot of people that depend on this to keep a roof over their house. You know, it used to be when when we started, even when I started driving carriage, you know, thirty almost thirty years ago now, um, it, it was it wasn't it wasn't really a career job for a lot of people. But what I see now for my carriage drivers, especially, is a lot of them have turned this into a career. It's a nice lifestyle. It's a nice way to make a living. Uh, you get to work with animals. You work outside. And uh, yeah, try to make it a good place to work. What has that been? That demand been for animals? I'm sorry. What has the demand been for animals? You know, so the surprisingly, it's it's been really an interesting market in the horse market. Right. Uh, when COVID first hit, I think me included was worried. I was worried, how am I going to feed these things? <laughs> you know, just because the carriage business was shut down. Yeah. Feet need to be done. They got to eat. Uh, you know, so I was super concerned, and I had a couple of prospect animals that I had in the herd that I was getting ready to start that spring. I went ahead and sold them off to just concentrate on, on my main herd. Um, and you know, horse prices have just been sky high, shockingly. And you know how people are feeding them and how people fed them through COVID, but uh, the horse market right now is really, really, really hot. And what are those prices right now? Since it's, you know, so you know, horses that we would pay, you know, anywhere from three thousand to five thousand. You're looking at seven to ten thousand dollar range now. So you know, you're talking almost double in some cases. And not you know, listen. There's a deal to be had here and there, sure. but those deals are are few and far between. And you know, the, the, 
my uh, one of my jobs is going to find those animals. Sure. And that requires a lot of travel, you know, going to different communities, a lot of time in the Amish community. But with travel uh, kind of curtailed like it was, I basically lost almost a whole year of going, right, looking for that one and looking for this one. And, you know, trying to find animals to do this job. You know, it's not a difficult job. They just got to have a brain sure. uh, to do it. So, you know, to go out and find those animals, it's not quite a full-time job, but it's a pretty close to a full-time job. And if somebody wants to actually work here at Palmetto Care Works, how do they go about that? Yeah, so, you know, it start, I pretty much, uh, you know, I pretty much hire almost anybody that comes in the door uh, because, you know, the type of personality that it takes to do this job is all over the board. You know, I've got three former lawyers that work here. Guys that just wanted to come do something different. Got a guy that uh, worked at the University of North Carolina as a professor. Uh, I got a girl that was working at Waffle House, the same one Nancy Mace worked sure. before. Right. Didn't want to do that down here. So, you know, it's just all over the place. And, you know, I say I hire everybody that comes in the door. You know, we go resume, we do, uh, you know, we do references and things like that. But, you know, as far as the personality, um, it's, it just, it's just such a, an interesting job and a niche job. The people that come in, I want to give everybody that chance. And, uh, and we do. You know, we've got a training program from uh, teaching the tour guides, uh, you know, the, the tour. The city has their manual to drive a carriage in Charleston, or excuse me, to drive a carriage for Palmetto Carriage. Um, you've got to be a city certified tour guide. You know, the city last year or year before took away the um, tour guide license. Right. But the Charleston Tour Association uh, start, started the Palmetto Guild. Right. And the Palmetto Guild, basically, to be a member of the Palmetto Guild, you have to pass the city uh, test. Right. And uh, so that's a requirement uh, to be a tour guide here at Palmetto Care. So we help people pass that test. We help them work on the tour. We help teach them how to drive the carriage. You tie it all together, and then you become a tour guide at Palmetto Care. And how many of those people have actually passed that test, and how many have actually failed it? You know, everybody that's working at Palmetto Carriage has passed the test. Um, you know, I did it when it was the city of Charleston tour guide license. Right. Some of the newer tour guides have taken the test right. and they've passed it and so they're a city certified. I think that's the, the lingo that we have to use now. They're a city certified. But they can't get a tour for me unless they pass the test. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Tommy Doria Jr., thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quintess Gold Sucks. Thanks, Quinn. And, and well, last, one, one last question. Mm -hmm. what, will be, what is the infrastructure like? For Palmetto Coverage Works, how long can you go on? Oh, you know, listen, we're going to go until I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I've got two kids. You know, we'll see what interest they have uh, in the business. I've got, uh, I've got half a dozen nieces and nephews. Uh, you never know. I, I, you know, I like the business. I enjoy the animals. I enjoy the people. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll we'll keep doing it until we can. That's that's sort of uh, that, that's my that's my plan as of right now. That is, and what is your plan for the next five years? Uh, I'd like to see the business grow. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we, we've had steady growth since I took over almost 20 years ago, and it's something that I'm super proud of, and I'd like to continue that growth, maybe not at the, the level that we've done it in the last 20 years, but I think it's going to be important for the success of, you know, whether it's my kids or whether it's my nieces and my nephews or my brothers or my sisters or, you know, whoever else might take it over. And what were those higher levels in the past five years? You know, we saw uh, right after, I guess it was 2010, 2011, we saw tremendous growth. But, you know, we saw, Carriage, Public Carriage saw tremendous growth as the city of Charleston mm -hmm. saw tremendous growth and tremendous popularity. You know, Helen Hill over at the CDB does a great job of selling the city yeah. and, uh, and getting people to come here. So we kind of rode that wave. And while I'm sitting here taking credit for that growth, there, there were a lot of things that played into that. And, you know, arguably the biggest thing was the popularity of Charleston and the growth of the, the industry as a whole uh, over you know, the last 20 years, I would say. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, buddy. You're welcome.